I've devoted a fair amount of my adult life to studying and trying to improve the human side of businesses and organizations. So the human resources, or HR function, is one area with which I interact frequently. I think HR does important work and has the potential to be a powerful force for organizational capability. At the same time, HR is rife with examples of non-evidence-based thinking. Quite simply, there are some big topics, like hiring, in which many HR professionals don't know what practices are supported by research and which ones aren't. In this episode, we discuss. And regardless of whether you're in the world of HR or not, I think you'll find this conversation interesting and useful. Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. Right, so today we're going to talk about this thing called the research practice gap and why it matters. We're going to talk about how we measure that gap and where it shows up in HR and implications for all of us. And, you know, but the thing is, I think most people look to HR and like, dude, they got it. <laughs> Maybe. I'm trying, I'm trying <laughs> to keep the lights on, make sure the bills get paid and all that stuff. And it's like, hey, HR, can you make sure we don't get sued because we have some weird sexist manager? Oh, <laughs> and we need top talent to fuel the growth of this organization. Could you help us out with that? Yeah. Well, I think in many organizations, uh, HR fulfills more of an administrative and compliance role. Right uh, now, my uh, mission when I talk with HR students uh, in the graduate program that I teach in is, hey, let's let's move beyond that and let's be more strategic and help the organization build its capability through its people, all of those types of things. So, you know, I think it depends on the organization in terms of, you know, how people view the HR function. But as, as I mentioned in the intro, I think it's an important function. I think it's one that deals with the human side of organizations and can be a really important and powerful force for building what the organization needs. But there's this thing called the research practice gap. And so we'll start there. And, you know, this is a, a vexing problem. It's something that we talk about a lot in industrial and organizational psychology, at least. And it has to do with this idea that, you know, there's certain things that we know in science, right? So, for those of you who don't know, if you're listening to this podcast or if you've listened to any of our episodes, you probably realize that this is the case. But if you don't know, there are many researchers who for decades uh, and entire fields of research that have studied and continue to study work and organizations. It's not just in industrial and organizational psychology. There are people who work in, for example, um, occupational and organizational sociology and organizational communication and management and all of these other related fields. And uh, there are some things that we have found through that research and through that careful study uh, that I would consider to be more evidence-based than not, right? And the, the struggle is that then we see uh, people in organizations doing things or holding on to beliefs that just don't align with what we seem to know, at least at this point, from all of that careful study and research. Yeah, so many people grow up in organizations, and it's monkey see, monkey do. Hey, I'm the product of what I've seen before me and managers I've had. So if you're in HR, right, you you grew up in an org, you probably said, all right, here's your 1099 or W-2 forms and all that stuff. And then maybe you get like a SHRM designation. So you learn some mm -hmm. professional HR tactical skills. And a bit that's kind of the table stakes, keep the lights on kind of stuff about HR, employment law, like really bread and butter type stuff. But when it comes to more nuanced pieces of organizational life, um, learning and development for managers and leaders, um, workforce strategy, I all these HR guys that I know and gals and people and non-binary pals, all those kinds of people say, I want to be more strategic. The C-suite needs to listen to me. But then they go shoot themselves in the foot by not understanding what thought leadership really looks like in that area. And this is not thought leadership of 
somebody on LinkedIn put thought leader on their, they clicked edit profile <laughs> <laughs> and put thought leader under their name. This is actual evidence-based practice about, and you cannot intuit evidence-based practice often. Right. Right. And th that's why we had to do the research. It's like, hey, are our assumptions correct in this area? Yeah. Well, and I also would suggest that, um, you know, you, you mentioned that many people in organizations kind of have a monkey see, monkey do approach. And, you know, in the absence of other things like that is totally <laughs> reasonable. Uh, yeah, to, that's to do way that, better right? than just doing things randomly. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I would say that, you know, uh, in the in the absence of other types of information, looking around you and seeing what seems to be reasonable, and what's working, what's not and doing what, you know, makes sense. It reminds me of um, the, uh, you know, from The Office, uh, the, the American version of The Office, in which there's a, um, a scene where Dwight Schrute, uh, one of my favorite characters in the show, uh, he says something like, uh, you know, best thing that Michael, his boss, ever said to me, don't be an idiot, right? So, <laughs> so if I'm thinking about two choices, I think, would an idiot do that? If an idiot would do that, I do not do that thing, right? So, <laughs> so there is some, it's hilarious, but it, it does have, I think, some, some, uh, some purpose. And I also would suggest that it's not just that, you know, there's all these people who know everything about how organizations should work. And we sit in the ivory tower and, and we know best. The research practice gap also goes the other way, meaning that there are things that really are important in the workplace, concerns that real managers and real leaders have that we're not studying in, in academia, uh, or maybe we're doing things that just really are irrelevant um, for everyday organizational life. Uh, and, you know, some research is designed to be more applied in nature. Some is more basic research, and I get that. Um, but I just want to also just kind of put that caveat on there that, hey, this research practice gap goes both ways. Um, and, you know, um, I also think it's important. Let's not go overboard. We don't need to catastrophize right there. There is a uh, good interaction, I think, between science and practice in some realms. I think some organizations do this much better than others. Uh, some organizations really try to take a step back and make sure that they're using the evidence to to support what they're doing. And evidence it also comes from a handful of sources, right? So I will put in the show notes uh, a link to a great overview of evidence-based practice from uh, Rob Breener. Rob Breener was on our podcast uh, a long time ago, and gosh, what a what a guy! Um, he's out there, you know, carrying the torch for evidence-based practice. And uh, I would encourage you to follow him on LinkedIn or Twitter because he oftentimes puts out um, he points out the the folly of non-evidence-based thinking in humorous ways. I'll just put it that way. So. Uh, but he suggests that there are a handful of, of sources of, of evidence, right? So, you know, one source of evidence is, yeah, academic peer-reviewed research. Another one might be data that you're looking at within your organization. There's also a realm of best practice that you're looking at. So, you know, there are a handful of, of ways that you can look at evidence, and I think it's important to consider all of them. Right. The disappointing thing about the way the academy yes. conducts itself, right, is you know, you go to grad school, you get your PhD, maybe you do a postdoc. And a lot of times your research interests are shaped by who you grew up under, your, your, you know, academic advisors and that kind of stuff. Now you may branch out, but generally there's some kind of, you know, group of study or a lab at your academic university that focuses on something. And then you just find your way into that hidey hole of funding publishing, and then maybe a tenure track job somewhere else. Whereas myself coming from a software development, project management, and accounting background said, well, that's backwards. That's a horrible use of human capital. We should go out into the workplace and find the most important problems, the impact of most people that have the most deleterious effect on human flourishing. And then, the, all right, who wants this one, right? Mm -hmm. And then we only hand out funding for stuff that's solving the problems that we're doing right now. And so to me, I mean, yeah, we have what people research and then what goes on in orgs as the kind of like textbook definition of gaps. But I always look at the gaps between the needs and what we're doing. That would be like, like in my feeble project management mind over here, Ben, that would be like, hey, there's a global pandemic. It's called COVID. 
yeah, we're going to keep doing this research on this vaccine for like, I don't know, elbow rashes. It just seems so <laughs> odd to have. Now, it's not that grossly misrepresented. There's lots of academics. Uh, Stephen Rogelberg, which sits on our academic advisory board for our firm and our podcast, you know, he studies meetings. Everybody goes to meetings. So, and mm -hmm. he's very concerned with what we call translational work. Like, how do we get what we know in the sciences to be practical and applicable in the workplace? So, like, we can't catastrophize, but on a on the size of what we need versus what we're doing. I'd like to push the needle a lot more to the what we need side of things. Yeah, yeah, and and I am highly sympathetic to that entire line of reasoning, Chris. You know, um, and I would it's it's not your. I would also say your self deprecating comment about your your feeble project management mind. No, I I think <laughs> you're, I think you're thinking exactly right about it. I think in an ideal world with the right incentives, we would have this master list of what organizations really need to know more about, and then. Uh, we would have the best researchers out there, you know, compete for and write and and also collaborate to tackle these things. But the truth is, is that's just not how the system is set up. And so we end up with, uh, you know, some people doing really good research that is is focused on applied problems. We also have places, uh, you know, people who do research that's maybe more tangential. It's all it's all necessary though. I don't want to denigrate anybody's research areas. Um, I would just suggest that there there are some incentive problems that contribute to this research practice. Yeah, name gap, some of those right? incentives. Well, I mean, I think you kind of highlighted one of them in terms of we we study what we're interested in. We're stu we study um, maybe something that our academic advisor got us into an, an area. And there's a lot of sunk costs, actually, when you start researching one area, because it takes a lot of time to build up a, a substantial amount of knowledge to even be able to know what search words to put into Google Scholar to figure out more about it, right? It you have to build up a vocabulary and understanding of a certain, and this is not just like, oh, I just want to know a lot about, you know, organizational psychology. No, I'm talking about very specific things. Like I want to be able to know, you know, the, the relationship between fairness perceptions and leadership. Like that ben, is an I, I want to pause right? you there. Everybody says, hey, go Google it. Or here, <laughs> let me go Google it for you. Yeah. Actually, when you get into the realm of academia, having strong Google foo is like really takes a lot of time to get to. Right, right. Like sometimes you will ask me a question. Hey, hey, is there any research, uh, you know, on this? And 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 I have to think about it a lot because, uh, you know, there probably is, but we probably call it something different and we look at it from a different angle. And I don't necessarily have the deep expertise in that area to confidently say, yes, we should search for this, right? I would have to do some digging and figure it out. Um, so, you know, there's, so that's, that's an issue. I don't know. You have know. to spend years just to be able to cut yourself well. It, it, it can take As some an time. academic. Yeah. And, and, and <laughs> I mean, it's, I've gotten used to it now because I, I have a bit of an eclectic research portfolio. You know, I research a bunch of different things. I'm interested in a lot of different things. I have more of an applied taste for things. Like I like to see what's going on out in the world and say, I want to study that, right? And th that sometimes requires me to then be a little bit of a, a neophyte in an area and take some time to learn it. Um, I find that exciting. I'm used to the the feeling of, uh, I feel really dumb right now. It's kind of fun though for a little bit. And then you don't feel dumb after a little while. Um, so that's part of the problem here. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, I think some of the other reasons for this research practice gap is, um, there isn't really a, a, a natural incentive oftentimes for there to be communication between the people who are doing this type of uh, stuff in real life and the people who are researching it. I think, um, industrial and organizational psychology, I think does this a little bit better. Um, not, it's not perfect, but we do it a little bit better perhaps than some other academic disciplines because about half of the people in that discipline, about half the people who have a doctorate in it go into industry and then about another half go into academia. And so we get together at conferences and we kind of see what's going on in both. And maybe we hang out with each other a little bit and go to each other's seminars. And, or, you know, I think that that, that kind of interaction does matter. Um, it's also just challenging to get the information out there. You know, one thing that we're trying to do on this podcast, Chris, I know, we're beat the drum, ben. we beat are it. trying <laughs> to engage with this research practice gap. We are trying to translate some things out there. And we're also maybe, uh, if there are academics out there listening to our podcast, and I know there are, uh, maybe listening to this will give inspire you to research something that that we see of relevance out in the real world, out in the wild, as you would say. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's, that's another piece of this. Um, the 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 things that you know. So, for example, if I'm publishing things on my in my academic role, 
uh, it'll go in a journal that other professors will read um, and use to research similar things. Yeah, everybody uh, gives each other a high five. Yeah. Look at the smart thing I did. Look, it's on paper. <laughs> and, high five, high five, put it on a shelf and it's gone. Right. And well, and the problem is that if you don't have a if you're not affiliated with the university or have um, you know, a way to access peer reviewed research articles through these databases and they're so not forth, cheap. They're no, not it's like, cheap. It's like, oh, you can download this for forty dollars for just one article. And I'm, and you don't I'm, even know if it's going to meet And I'm need. sorry, but there are very few articles out there that are worth 40 bucks. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> for one of them. I mean, I'm saying that because I get them all for free or most of them. So, but uh, that, that is a barrier, right? It is a, it is a legitimate real structural barrier like if i if i'm out there and i want to read this stuff i might not have access to it right so that that's another issue um with this whole whole thing and so let's talk about why this matters yeah yeah so you know we're, we're beating the drum on the research practice gap and we're going to get to some things that hr people get wrong but i mean fundamentally it's it's problematic because it it hurts decision making in organizations, we can do we right. we make better decisions when we have better information. I think that's I think that's a non controversial thing to say. Still, right? <laughs> I think having good information can help us make good good decisions. And if we don't know the the research or the evidence on something, then we do default to the the monkey see monkey do or you know um, the this is what I see right and this is what I'm going to try. Uh, we we work with the realm of what within you know that which of we're aware we're aware of certain things so we deal with it we we use that information so that's that's one reason why it really matters. Here's the thing: more information helps you make better decisions. If and yes. this comes from David Krakauer, I think he he was with the Santa Fe Institute. I forget where he is now. He may still be be there. He says if you're not stupid, mm. and David defines stupidity as having a rule that makes it to where you can't arrive at truth. And so an example of this is we used to think that the earth was the center of the universe. It's right? not. And, yeah, like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like Galileo said, guys, all of this stuff, all the stars and everything makes sense when we look at it as if the sun was the center of the universe, which ended up, or at least our portion of it, right? Which ended up being right. And they spent so long trying to chase him down and kill him because they had a rule that, no, nope, the earth has to be the center, right? And it precluded that information being able to get into people's brains and help them, right? And, so you, and there still are people who believe there's a flat earth, right? Right. But <laughs> I, I, we got to take, there are things that yeah. people take as like stone cold, like, yes. And I get this all the time, generations. Mm -hmm. We we did a whole episode on Court Rudolph. I was on an HR forum the other day, and I was like, hey, I just want to throw this out here. You know, the generation stuff has been thoroughly debunked. Check out Court's paper if you want an introduction to not only the conversation, but all the other research that shows this as garbage. Hey, and by the way, we need to uh, just throw out there that Court Rudolph was named a fellow of the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology. So congratulations, yes. Court Rudolph. That's really yeah, cool. Can, well couldn't deserved. happen to a better guy, right? No, we, we like him. But if you say no generations must be true because you've been fed that stuff for so long, it precludes you from seeing the information that'll to allow you to update your worldview. Mm -hmm. And we see this in Dweck's work where they kind of talk about having a fixed mindset. Oh, I've learned these HR things. I've learned these organizational things. I'm not even interested into the evolving conversation about organizational life. Yeah. Or you can have a growth mindset of like, hey, I think this now. But, oh, is there something else here? Right. Right. And I think that growth mindset is really important if you want to have an evidence-based approach. Yeah. So it's, and Krakauer would say, if you don't essential, have that growth right. mindset, you're yeah. stupid. And, and, and also, stupid has nothing to do with how smart you are. <laughs> it's if, can you upgrade your thinking? And I right. would encourage you to be always be willing to upgrade your thinking. Great. You know, a few other reasons really quickly why this research practice gap really matters is that you know, it just if you don't have a good grounding in perhaps what works and what doesn't uh, from the evidence, then you're going to waste a lot of time. You're going to waste a lot of effort, waste a lot of money on stuff that just doesn't get you where you want to go. You're going to lose top talent. Yep. You'll right? lose top talent. You'll you'll think that uh, a, a, a one hour training program is going to help with everything. And it's not <laughs> right. Um and I guess the big reason, since we're talking about, in my perspective, is coming from the world of 
the human side of organizations, is that when we use non-evidence-based uh, methods and thought patterns and have these beliefs about how organizations work and how people behave, uh, it can really negatively impact real people and their lives and their careers. And that is a shame. Yeah, stop the insanity. Ah, <laughs> that's right. You know, you got to stop the madness. And the thing is, the first step is being aware that, hey, there may be a higher level conversation going down in a field that you may feel is already settled. And I think HR people might, you know, I don't have research on this, but it would make sense to me that they might have a like an influence on this because so much of the HR education pathway is kind of black and white. Yes or no, like employment law, mm -hmm. if this, then this, but when we get into stuff of like, how do we, what are the best ways to hire people? So it makes it more probable. Look at that. I said more probable. You know, I, I can't tell you how many managers like, yeah, I only hire good people. <laughs> like, well, if that's the case, you've not hired a lot of people. I've hired hundreds of people. One client that I worked with on an engagement, I hired like 200 technologists in that organization in a period of nine months. You know, you're going to have some people not work out right. if, you know, it's at, at and, scale, right? So but somebody I, who says, I'm a good manager because I only hire perfectly. Mm, that's not backed up. Right. So, so I think you bring up a really good point. And this has to do with this entire idea of evidence-based thinking and evidence-based practice, which is that in the world of, you know, humans and complex organizations, what we're trying to do is increase the probability of making good decisions and decrease the probability of making bad decisions. This is not an exact, um, you know, I, I, it is a science, but there's also some art to it. And it's not something that's perfect, right? We, there are still things that we, so many variables, right? That, you know, if I want to, for those of you who are familiar with, uh, with, multiple regression in the statistical sense, you know, the, the truth is oftentimes in the error term, the things that we don't know much about, right? Um, so there, there's always going to be that um, unexplained stuff that happens. But we, if we at scale can increase the probability of making good decisions, that's a great thing. And if we can decrease the probability of making bad decisions, that's a great thing as well. Uh, so it's it's not it's not going to be as exact as perhaps um, you know the things that are done by my colleagues over in the physical sciences, but uh, it really does matter. Yeah, and that's why I think the names mixed up. You know, they say the hard science huh. and the soft science. Like the hard, what we call hard science is actually the easier, more concrete science, <laughs> right? The the social sciences, the political sciences, those are the hard ones. Well, they're and hard just, because they're extremely messy because we're dealing with humans. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And just this perception thing. So if you're going to design, let's say you buy a casino in Vegas and you're going to design a brand new gambling game, the best gambling game would be as close to 50-50 odds without getting to 50-50 odds as possible. Mm -hmm. Because your human perception, and you see this at like blackjack tables and stuff, like, oh, this table's hot. That's not how statistics work. You play enough hands, the percentage is going to come out there, you know? And, and if you know the rules of the game, you can get a 1% or 2% advantage, but you're never going to crack 50. Now, if you go into an organization on hiring and say, listen, you know, we, we, if you follow these best practices, and this is just an example, this isn't like real, but if you follow these best hiring stuff, you're going to hire correctly 70% of the time. A lot of people are going to be like, God, that seems so low. Mm -hmm. Really? 30% of my hires are going to be garbage? But let's go back. If you have the house advantage at 50.5%, you're going to take everybody's money over time that comes to Vegas. Right. Right? So anyway. Yeah. No, I think that that's, that's, a, that's a good point, right? So if you're a manager out there and you say, hey, I tried that evidence-based thing that Chris and Ben were talking about, and I hired somebody and they didn't work out. Obviously, that evidence-based practice doesn't work. No, that's not how any of this works, my friend, right? <laughs> it, it may not have worked out in that instance, but o over the course of um, how you should be conducting this, whatever area of your business is overall, 
you're still increasing the odds, right? And so, this is honesty. Because yeah. the guy that comes to you with this concrete, and because there's lack of evidence-based thinking, it's easy to peddle snake oil to organizations. Right. Hey, yeah. man, I've got the no joke guarantee. And they're like, okay. And then you roll that training out to your whole organizations. And they've got your cash and are gone to the next victim before you ever realize, hey, I should have listened to the guys that were honest about the like noise and the data and the percentages yeah. and that kind of stuff. Exactly. Okay, so let's move on now. And we're going to talk about some various things out there. And this all comes from a an article that we'll post a link to in the show notes it came out in uh, just last year, 2021. Um, and it's in the Journal of Personnel Psychology. I'm not going to even read the title for it because I don't want to give away anything about what we're, we're going to talk about here. But what, what I'd like to start with is I'd like to simply read some statements. And, you know, if you're out there listening to this, you can, you know, pull over to the side of the road if you're in your car and, and or maybe just keep a mental tally of each one of these, whether or not it is true or false. There's 10 of them, and they're true or false questions. And uh, we'll go through each one, and then we'll discuss, were these true or false? And what's interesting is that in this study uh, that we're referencing these from, uh, they went out and they asked a whole bunch of HR people to, uh, you know, s tell whether or not these are true or false. Okay, these and, aren't lay people; these are right. HR professionals right. so, who and, should know. Right, right, right. So, but we'll talk about what kind of what they found after you take the quiz yourself. All right. So, um, should I read them all, or do you want to switch back and forth, Chris? I mean, yeah, you have the better voice, Ben. So do it. I will read it in a dramatic <laughs> way. Okay, so <laughs> here we go. Okay, so statement number one: true or false? Each one of these is true or false. Although people use many different terms to describe personalities, there are really only four basic dimensions of personality as captured by the MBTI. Or that's, that's Myers-Briggs for those Myers-Briggs type indicator, okay? So that's statement number one. Is that true or false? Number two, true or false? Conscientiousness is a better predictor of overall job performance than general mental ability or IQ. True or false? Number three, true or false? Companies that screen app job applicants for values have higher jo overall job performance than those that screen for general mental ability or IQ. Okay. Number four, true or false? Integrity tests don't work well in practice because so many people lie on them. Number five, true or false? Integrity tests have adverse impact on racial minorities. True or false? Number six, the most valid employment interviews are designed around an applicant's unique background. Number seven, true or false? Being very intelligent is actually a disadvantage for performing well on a low-skilled job. Number eight, true or false? There is very little difference among personality inventories in terms of how well they predict an applicant's overall job performance. Now, what's a personality inventory, Ben, for our listeners? Sure. It's a personality test, a personality questionnaire, right? Yeah. There, so there's there not a whole lot of difference in the different personality tests in how, terms of how well they predict an applicant's overall job performance. Right. That's the, that's the statement. You decide if it's true or false. And we will tell you the answer in a moment. Number nine. True or false, emotional intelligence is a better predictor of overall job performance than general, general mental ability or IQ. And the last one, number 10. True or false, a skilled graphologist, i.e. handwriting analysis expert, can be helpful in predicting overall job performance. Okay, so hopefully you thought about those, true or false. You know, if you need to go back and rewind a few moments and, and listen to them again, go for it. Uh, but here we go. Maybe we should go through each one and say whether or not they're true or false. Well, first, let's give the overall summary. If yes. you put true for any of these, you are wrong. <laughs> Every single one of those 10 <laughs> items is a myth. It's a myth. Those are all false. And what's interesting is this study that we're referencing these from, we didn't make these up. Uh, this study is... Um, it's called. This is in Canada and the U.S. The yep, same. They, they study both Canadians and Americans. So it's the title is "Selection Myths: A Conceptual Replication of HR Professionals' Beliefs About Effective Human 
resource practices in the U.S. and Canada. So there, uh, basically, they, there was a 2002 study where they asked a bunch of HR people. They said, here's a bunch of myths. Tell me if you think this is true or false. And then they said, you know, the percentage of them that said it was false, they said, okay, well, that's that's our kind of our, our measure of the research practice gap, right? Because all these things have been studied a lot, right? And we do know- And if you look at the percentages, if you're a CEO and you looked at the percentages here, I would be depressed. Yes, because it, it, it is somewhat depressing. Of, the amount of stinking thinking among HR people, the people you've tasked with leading up, because you know your managers do your hiring, but your HR people are supposed to say, hey, manager, that's actually not that good of a job description. Or, hey, let's talk about maybe a interview rubric or you know different kinds of, they're supposed to plus up the people in your organization so they're not bringing in numbskulls. Right. And at the end of the day, it's abysmal the amount that HR people know about actually hiring people. So when right. we say selection, it, we're talking about selecting an employee for your org or hiring. Right. Exactly. Okay, so they uh, gathered a bunch of data. They they asked 119 Canadian participants, and they had 334 American participants. Um, their results were you know, fairly similar for the two different groups here. Uh, but okay, let's yeah, go Yeah, there's through. nobody can be like, the Canadians can't be like, we're way smarter than the Americans. That may yeah. be true, but not in HR. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, okay. So the number, the percent false means the percent correct, right? So the percent correct on each one of these. So the first one was, although people use many different terms to describe personalities, there are really only four basic dimensions of personality as captured by the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Um, Canadian participants, uh, 26% said, yep, that's false. American participants, 18% said, yes, that's false. So the Canadians we, have it on that one, <laughs> a, a but, not by much. <laughs> not by much. <laughs> well, but but here's the, we, we want to see that much higher. Now, there was a large percentage of people who were uncertain about it. So they weren't, you know, it wasn't like all of them said, this is true for sure. Um, but that's that's troubling. And it's troubling because the Myers-Briggs type indicator is about as good as a horoscope. I, I have it's it's not supported by and there's so much research, money to be made right? selling it. There, there to is orcs. right. It's a parlor game, right? And it's it can be fun, um, but I think that you know even if it is fun and enjoyable, I don't think it's helpful. I think overall it does damage because it makes people think that they are this certain type, right? It's not reliable, meaning that if you take it again, it's probably gonna be something different. If you uh, you know. But let's uh, say it was totally true. It has nothing to do with job performance, which well, is that's what true you too, should right? be so caring it, about. It, yeah, it doesn't have criterion related validity. So don't use it for hiring ever. Um, and and in terms of the four basic dimensions of personality, no, it, it seems like there's probably more like five dimensions of personality or more, or more, or more. But, but it's, you know, and there are kind of subdivisions of them, but the big five is oftentimes a um, a way that we think about uh, a research-based way to think about uh, personality, especially as it pertains to the workplace, right? So about eighty percent of HR professionals got this wrong. Yeah, and yeah. you let, let, let's reverse that. Let's say eighty percent got them right. That would mean there's a whole twenty percent. Think of all the organizations out there. A whole twenty percent that would be lost in a sauce. Yeah. That would still be discouraging. But here. My God, 80% are, are, are full of baloney here. Ah! All right, let's do the next one. Okay, so uh, number two, conscientiousness is a better predictor of overall job performance than general mental ability or IQ. And, uh, you know, in this one, it was about 20% for both Canadians and Americans. In other words, 80% it, so, wrong. <laughs> right. And, you know, I can't believe they put this like 20% got it right. You know, and it's like, <laughs> I think the glaring thing, somebody needs to get a data visualization class yeah. for these guys. But well, 80% yeah, also maybe, wrong. But, but also, um, you know, 50 to 60% of them were uncertain about this. So they didn't really know. Right. So that, that that's, yeah. uh, that's a little bit promising. But here's here's the the what seems to be relatively um, supported by the evidence is that general mental ability or IQ really does matter for job performance, right? Now, whether or not we assess that, how we assess it, if we or use Or even that, if that really smart guy in the cubicle right. next to you is nice to sit next to when it yeah. comes to performing their job, yeah. smart people like, do it good. Right, Be, you know, having reasoning well. skills um, does seem to matter. And 
Uh, conscientiousness as a personality characteristic, which is your attention to detail, being organized and everything. Nice to that, have. It's a very nice to have. And actually, as a personality-related predictor, it is the strongest one. But uh, it's not. It, it, it hasn't really outperformed uh, mental ability or IQ in most of the research out there. Okay. Like people like you, Ben, but you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, mental ability, IQ, it matters more than conscientiousness. That's the takeaway point for our friends out there. Uh, number three, companies that screen job applicants for values have higher overall job performance than those that screen for general mental ability or IQ. Um, similar results here, right? So uh, only about 18% of the participants said this was false. So about, you know, 80% um, were either uncertain or said it was true. Um, you know, again, you could sell this. Let, here's could. how the pitch would go, Ben. You're the CEO. I'm sure the like, people who do sell it. Yeah, uh, Ben, you've gone through like um, a values based, you know, reformat of your organizations. You've got a mission statement you've got values at line you're going to hire off of your values and and part of that thing with your values is that we've discovered and they may have not a study they may have a white paper that they give you right yep. we found in five out of you know we've 90 percent of the organizations we've worked with screening for values gets you higher job performance and you can see C-suite execs that don't know this and not supported by HR execs that don't know about this either saying, well, my God, I, I'm a values driven person. I've baked my values into the organization. Let's start screening for values. Yeah. Well, and it's not to say that values may not matter at all, but here the point is- They that do it's, matter. It's, right. It's, but it's not going to um, over, you know, it's not necessarily going to have incremental predictive validity beyond- uh, that of general mental ability or IQ. Okay, so number four, integrity tests don't work well in practice because so many people lie on them. That That is also um, a, a myth, right? And so I guess, first of all, I just need to say what an integrity test is. So uh, integrity tests are, are um, questionnaires that are designed to ostensibly... Um, would you ever take or, a pencil home from work? Yeah, to, to detect whether or not people would uh, engage in, in various types of um, nefarious, uh, activities. nefarious activities, right? So <laughs> counterproductive work behaviors, uh, stealing, lying, dishonesty. And I've seen that one. Like, would you take a pen or yeah. pencil? Would you take whatever? And accoutrements home. Right. And so there's, I mean, I'm not going to get into all the research on integrity tests. Um, there are various ways that they are constructed. And, you know, the bottom line is that they, they do tend to work to some degree. They have some validity if they're well-designed. Um, and you know, it's, it's people, People may try to lie on them, right? Or they may just try to make things up. But, you know, one could also say that, hey, if, uh, you know, <laughs> one, one view of the, the faking literature, right? So there's a whole literature on people who fake personality tests, right? Um, and, uh, but it's, it's also a little bit of a sign of intelligence, uh, perhaps, but that, <laughs> that you, you know, what, what's, what yeah, you lied on all of the integrity um, tests. But, but so you're smart. The, no, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but some of them also have, for example, measures of social desirability in there, right. To try to gauge like, Hey, this person is really just trying to, you know, guess and please the, uh, the, the person who's analyzing these re results. So, um, they do tend to work to some degree. Um, very few people would study enough, uh, uh, survey design and the requisite IO site to really cheat on this well. Yeah. Like yeah. you'd have to know a lot. Right, right. Um, number five is integrity tests have adverse impact on racial mi minorities, meaning that, you know, um, that's some, a racist question right there. Well, yeah, I, I would, I would, people I, of I color, thought of that too, right? Yeah. Pe that, people of color won't <laughs> pass an integrity test. What yeah. the heck is that? I agree. Yeah. I, I was, I thought the exact same thing as I was reading through it the first time. Um, and, uh, so that's, you know, but, but in the data here, we had, uh, you know, 65% wrong. Yeah. 65%. So they're doing uh, better, a little less racist than they are uninformed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so that's a myth as well. So they don't, they don't tend to, there are some issues with integrity tests, right? Um, but adverse impact is not one of them. It doesn't seem to be. Number six is that the most valid employment interviews, right? are designed around an applicant's unique background, really trying to understand that person, where they come from, tell me about your experiences, all of that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, in, in this research, they had, uh, you know, about one out of every uh, 
uh, four said, yeah, hey, so that, that's 75% wrong. 75% did not say that that is, uh, um, you know, they did not correctly answer that one. But you right? can see that HR is like, hey, give us your background. We're reviewing resumes to see who we want to bring in an interview. Everything's background focus, background yeah. focus. But what's the better solution here? Well, the better solution here is to start with the job, right? Start with the job itself. Understand that job. Go through what we call job analysis. Try to understand what performance looks like in that job. And then what you're doing really is you're making a predictive hypothesis. You are saying, okay, well, if that's what's necessary, then um, here's the procedural knowledge and skill and the abilities required to do that job well. And then you take one more step and say, okay, well, if those are the the pieces of knowledge, skill, and ability and other characteristics that are required to do that job well, how might I assess for them? And let's design some questions around that, right? This is why the realistic work sample is one of the best selection criteria. So it's like, hey, we need somebody that can do this. And somebody walks into your office and be like, look, here's an example of me. Here's 10 examples right. of me doing exactly that. Right. Or, Does it matter what his background is? If he can do exactly what you need him to do? That's that's the key, right? Does it really matter? And, you know, so uh, someone's background may inform their ability to do it. Like, I think, you know, that it's one piece of it and it might might be um, might be useful to know. But the interviewer should really focus on those those aspects related to the job. Okay. One other thing here, software. I see this all the time in software. Well, mm. I've been a .NET developer for 10 years. And then I have to say, well, let's see your code. Well, this guy's been doing it for two years and his code's a lot more mature than yours. Mm, more you mature know, background code. you're looking for, I'm looking for somebody with seven to 10 years experience or, you know, okay. That's but so you, problematic because some people have 10 years of experience, but it was the same experience 10 times and they never row, learned right? each year they didn't learn the same <laughs> lessons they should have daggone learned oh. but so much of our hr hiring the way we do our job boards the way they query stuff on indeed or linkedin when you're doing applicant search is background 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 focus and i would encourage you if there's any way to find somebody that can provide you a work sample look at the work sample over yeah. the background guys and it's, if and it's, it's possible it's not possible right. everywhere yeah. And, and I mean, I think we look at background so much in hiring because it is easy. Right. And we, we for example, many jobs have requirements for education. Right. Requirements yeah. that must have a bachelor's in blah, 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 or a related field or a master's or whatever. Uh, and I just question that sometimes. We're, really? Maybe. Um, they do that in the Army, like in the National Guard. You can have an undergrad in Sumerian pottery mm -hmm. versus a guy with a Fulbright to the Middle East. And well, maybe the Fulbright guy didn't pay much attention. Doubtful, right? And they're on the same hiring plane. Mm. That masters, yes or no. Check. Check. Right. And and which is okay. I I would a better yeah. step would be do they have a requisite masters? Like, do you have a you're gonna be a military police officer? A, a degree in criminology yeah. could be cool. Sure, right? sure. But and way I, better to do yeah. like actual competency based testing of some sort or i agree i right. agree uh, you know one could make the argument and i think there's maybe some validity here that uh the completion of a four-year degree or the completion of a master's degree is a signal of uh work ethic perseverance or daddy you know, with it, cash or daddy with cash right right exactly it's not perfect uh, or, um, you know, maybe some level of intelligence to, to complete that course of study. Right. So it can be perhaps a rough proxy for some things that matter, but anyway, let's move on. Well, okay. one, last, one last thing on that. Guess we're not moving on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One last thing on that. <laughs> it, you're saying like, okay, maybe having a requisite degree is a little bit better, but we have all these examples that even big places like McKinsey. Well, yeah, we got this PhD in the humanities that has all this critical thinking mm -hmm. skills that are off the hook. That if you only, and what do you mean? You got a humanities PhD doing technology consulting? Yeah. You should see the creativity that we're getting out of this guy. Yeah. That's why looking just at degrees and what field, it's, it's just not good. It's just not good. All right. Yeah. Now we can go to the next one. <laughs> Outstanding. Number seven, being very intelligent is actually a disadvantage for performing well on a low-skilled job. 
And in this one, uh, the results this one's were a little interesting. Bit, this people one's a like, little bit, well. yeah. This one's so people are a little bit better here, right? So um, almost half, about forty-eight percent of the respondents said that that was false, right? That it and the, the correct answer is false again on all of these. So it is false that being very intelligent is actually a disadvantage for performing well on a low-skilled job. Turns out that being very intelligent, like you do better at all types of jobs, right? Now, the tricky thing is that uh, very intelligent people doing a low-skilled job, they might get bored after a while. Or or, or they may really have quickly. an addiction to podcasts like ours, and they <laughs> want a job that they can zone out and just listen to Indigo podcasts they, on repeat. Like, that, you never that, know. That, you never know. You, that is true. That is true. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, their, their intelligence actually does predict job performance really kind of for every type of job. Um, and, and so. we recognize the problem, you know, the tomatoes we're dodging the tomatoes. We recognize the problem with intelligence tests there, there, but they we're looking at probability and in indicators here. Yeah. We're not like the value of a person. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about the times that it, you know, gets it wrong. We're talking about increasing the odds, and actually, intelligence is a decent measurement for yeah, some. It things. is important. Now, as you mentioned, like work sample tests, really good, right? I, I would, I would use something like a work sample test if possible. Um, Always look for, for that if yeah, you can, because um, because usually the predictive validity in most studies that I've seen, it's it's almost it's about the same as an intelligence test. So anyway, yeah. I digress. Okay, so. Uh, number eight, um, there is very little difference among personality inventories in terms of how well they predict an applicant's overall job performance. So this is arguing that, Hey, you know, personality in inventories are, they're all pretty much the same. And, then, now, and this is chat. This is a tricky one. It, it's, it Be is a little Because tricky. we're talking personality versus performance mm -hmm. and there's not the strongest ties, even with the best personality tests on performance. There's some. But mm -hmm. it, it's not it's not like a work sample. Yeah, it's it's like. right. The, the predictive validity is not as high as something like that. But, you know, so they had um, about between 35 and 40 percent said that's false. And false, again, is a correct answer. Yeah, if you had true and, on any of these, you were wrong. Sorry. Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> so um, <laughs> sorry, yeah. not sorry. <laughs> the uh, the truth is that not all personality inventories are created equal. We've already done our um, obligatory bashing of the Myers-Briggs type indicator here earlier in the episode. Yeah, why not? It's uh, why not? It's it's a good punching bag. It's, it's like the, it really is it's the easiest punching bag um, in, in yeah, all of Yeah, matter of fact, there's Ford very side. few things because there's always caveats. And, and right. it's, it's science. It's messy. It's caveats. But most people, like if you ask them to take a, you know, a dump on something that's bad, Pretty yeah. much that Myers Briggs is easy. It's Nobody's gonna. <laughs> yeah, it's probably the the biggest piece of consensus in uh, in all of organizational psychology. But I get anyway. pushback in HR forums when I'm yeah. like, actually Myers Briggs, and and people hold on to it almost as a piece of religious faith. Some people get um like coffee mugs and stuff with their little four letters on it. Like I'm an INTJ, EST. Whatever. I'm an I, LMNOP. How about yeah, that? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So here's here's the here's the key, folks. Um, with regard to personality inventories, you want one that has been studied for predictive validity in a work context. So usually something that's based on the big five characteristics. Peer reviewed, not uh, white paper. <laughs> there you go. Because I can sell you everything on a white yeah. paper. Right. Um, okay. So number nine, emotional intelligence is a better predictor of overall job performance than general mental ability or IQ. That is indeed false. Um, but you know, we had, uh, you know, about 70% plus who, uh, you know, said that this was either true or they're uncertain about it. Um, so no, again, general mental ability or IQ is a better predictor than emotional intelligence. But there's so many articles on LinkedIn about yeah. emotional intelligence. And it sounds, it's it's really attractive, but emotional intelligence is a challenging piece to study. Now, really I haven't looked is. at it in a while, I, but I don't think we have an agreed scale to measure it yet, do we? You know, I'd have to go do more research on it too, but it is a, a bit of a contentious thing. Um, and, and one argument is that it's better characterized as social skill, right? So people who study intelligence get right. really nervous when someone starts calling something emotional intelligence because it's it's you know how can that actually be something right? But uh, social skill, you know, if there are things that maybe you could learn to better understand other people, understand yourself, how that pertains to how you have emotions, that kind of stuff. But okay, let's move to the last one here. Uh, but I just is... want to point out a positive there, Ben. 
And so I'm like, Ben, I don't even think there's a validated scale. And what do you immediately do? You're like, you know, I don't know. I'd have to go look. Yeah. Right. Rather than be like, oh, yeah, yeah. You're right. And and the better scientists will do that. They'll say, you know, I got to go find that out. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so the last one here, a skilled graphologist, which is a handwriting analysis expert, can be helpful in predicting overall job performance. Um, so you had uh, about 45 to 50 percent said that's false. Uh, this should have been closer to 100 uh, percent. I've met a hundred that say. I want to see a handwriting sample because, what? yeah, I know. Or people like, ah, uh, you could, you know, they somebody's maybe not performing so well. And then I've heard this, like, <sighs> so the first one is I want a handwriting sample. That's I've only met one person, but two other people have said, you know, when something's going off, they're like, well, look at his handwriting. You know, there's something going wrong. Up oh in my that gosh, brain. that's something wrong going up in that brain. Right. So what? I mean. So there's a a very well known um, meta- is every medical doctor then yeah <laughs> jacked up because if right. you look at their chicken scratch my that's, god that's and right. we and we we dispense drugs based on that kind <laughs> of stuff you can hardly read <laughs> so it's interesting there's a a very well known meta analysis that looking at various predictors of job performance and uh, one of the lowest. Uh, ones on that list is graphology, which is handwriting analysis. It how has, did it even make the list? Well, because did it have well, anything? It, no, no, it did. It didn't have any um, significant validity. So, the, right. uh, but it made the list because people have studied it, right? So they look at all these different things that people studied and said, "Well, no." In case all, you're all curious, these, the answer curious, is not just no, but heck no. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So don't resort to handwriting analysis. Okay, so we've gone through these 10 things. The overall takeaway, though, so we, we started with this research practice gap. And this is, in a sense, a measure of that research practice gap because it's saying, hey, here's a bunch of things that we we seem to know pretty well from research, but a lot of HR people don't seem to be familiar with these findings. And that's a, a there's a lot of HR people that are lost in the heuristic sauce. Yeah. When the heuristics a rule of thumb or monkey see monkey do type thinking and it's it's killing our organizations and well I mean if you're a CEO we'll just start to for some advice here. Yeah. You need to ask your HR leadership, "Hey, how are we validating our practice with evidence right mm-hmm. now?" And if the answer is like it sounds really weak. Oh, well, there's this nice vendor that came by. Look, I got these white papers or my personality tests it. Well, I just say, do not stone that HR person because whatever, eight out of 10 times, all of the other HR people are going to believe that kind of weird stuff, right? Yeah. But you got to start saying, okay, well, how can we start to move to a more evidence-based practice within our organization? Because this this other stuff isn't working, guys. That's right. That's right. You know, it reminds me, actually, we mentioned Rob Reiner already on the I podcast today. Because Well, he's just he's great when it comes to uh, evidence based practice. Right. He's one of the, the leaders. In I that. wish he was my best friend and lived next door. That, that's the kind of happy hours you would have with that guy. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. He shared something um, recently on, on Twitter and I'm trying to come. There it is. So he uh, he said. You know, this is the flawed logic of copying successful organizations. Yeah, right? so th- this is th- good. I saw this, this one too. <laughs> this is what a lot, a lot of people go through this process. We see it all the time when we talk to executives. Okay, so number one, organization X is successful, right? So Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, whatever, right? Organization X is successful. Number two, organization X does practice Y. Okay, so whatever, right? It could be some sort of human resource practice, something else. Number three, Organization X is successful because it does practice Y, right? Which is really hard to make that connection. That's that's called the difference between correlation and causation. Absolutely. And then number four, the the logic goes, if our organization adapts practice Y, we will also be successful. Wow. So that we see that that flawed logic very, very frequently. It's it's responsible for the business book industrial complex <laughs> the secrets of google right at right. the apple way or whatever and then they do this with ceos too yeah ceo and- is successful ceo does this he wears a you know when people were pitching for a while when facebook was really blowing up 
everybody was wearing a hoodie like Zuckerberg <laughs> so, because and, and they wouldn't wait. be doing it if it didn't work. So 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 <laughs> this is great. So, uh, Ra- Breeder Breeder shared another thing. It was uh, uh, the same version of that. Just exactly what you're saying, though, uh, except the flawed logic of copying billionaire tech bros. Number one. Oh, man, tech, I miss this one. Yeah. Tech bro X wears the same clothes every day. Number two, <laughs> tech bro Y meditates every morning. Number three, Tech Bro Z fasts all weekend. Number four, Tech Bro A takes ice baths. Number five, if I wear the same clothes every day, meditate every morning, fast all weekend, and take ice baths, I will become a billionaire Tech Bro. <laughs> yeah, I, but you see this, and, and and I saw this. So I I had some refugee kids that I was tutoring some years mm. back, and this was you know back you know shortly after I'd come out of being a professional musician. And they were like, oh, man, you know, I like I brought them over the house like they wanted to play guitar. So we plugged in the amps, made all the big, loud rock chords and and laughed our heads off. And they're like, I got them donated and helped purchase some equipment for them. And the deal was, it's like, all right, if you guys do your schoolwork and I review it, then I give you a guitar lesson for free. Right. So this Mm -hmm. kind of. But then after a couple of weeks, um, they stopped practicing. I'm like, what's going on? You know, you guys, well, we're working on our behind the music. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And that, dude, they had picked out band names. They had taken pictures of themselves in different outfits. They had like with their old cell phone, like videoed themselves talking about their origin stories. Because for them, I was like, first of all, you guys got to have some music to be behind <laughs> one. But for them, so much of music was the aesthetic being fashionable, having a cool name, having an origin story. There was none of this like do the work. Mm. And like you, I just want to break this because I see this all the time. You will never be a Steve Jobs. You will only be the best version of you. And and if if you want, like if there was a recipe, everybody would just copy it and there'd be a million Facebooks and Facebook wouldn't be worth any money in the marketplace because there was a million of them. Right. Right. Yeah. And so you got to be yourself and figure out these evidence-based stuff because that's how you end up winning. Yeah. So let, let's knock out a couple implications here. I think those are those are really good points. Let's let's um, uh, offer a few more. I think one of them is you know look for some of the research out there on something. Have a bit of a questioning and curious mindset with regard to HR practices. Question whether or not this is actually something that is evidence-based. That's the first thing I would tell any HR professional. And I also suggest that for people who are not within the HR function to be pushing that type of thinking um, among the rest of your team, right? So you can look for reviews of these types of topics um, in the academic literature. You can look for meta-analyses. Um, and what's a and meta-analysis for the so A meta-analysis is a quantitative uh, look at a bunch of different studies that have studied a similar thing where they can come up with um, you know, an approximation of what seems to be true based upon all of these different studies, right? That are looking at something. So yeah, so um, it'd be like important. if you were on the wire cutter review, it's like we looked at 800 papers on this topic and discovered the following common <laughs> themes, right? It's like that kind of. It's like a a sure. review of the literature, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, yeah, let's do another one. Yeah. So you know, I think another piece is, um, you know, I think you, you just need to be aware of what is coming out of academic research. I think that that is helpful. Um, You know, maybe questioning some of the sources for your information. Uh, You know, as you mentioned earlier in the episode, Chris, just looking for, you know, pithy things that are said on LinkedIn that seem to resonate with you. uh, You need to question that to some degree and say, is this truly evidence-based? Uh, and and if so, like, or if I think it is, why do I think that? That I think that's a, an important mindset to really get into. And this can sound exhausting. What I gotta get? I, know. I gotta totally like look at this, and I gotta. Oh. It's okay. <laughs> look at your key HR functions. One that's really important is selection, hiring the right people. Now, Sherm mm-hmm. and those kind of organizations handle the, you know, how many employees you need before you got to do this. Um, that well, the one I the drum I like to beat on that is the breastfeeding room because you know as my wife struggled finding places to breastfeed when we had our kids and that was mind numbing in a modern society. But you know, so Sherm focuses on like the check the box compliance issues. But when it comes to something like selection and hiring, you only have to go do that research once 
and then work with, maybe you have a working group with your HR people, maybe other business leaders in your org, and you develop a best practice or what your organization's practice is going to look like based on what you learn from the literature. And then once you've baked that in, you're good. Maybe you review it every three years or something to see if there's any new practice that you want to look in. So yeah, you do have to do this work of going out and finding out, well, what is evidence-based practice in this area? Yeah. But once you bake it in, you don't have that many functions in your HR department that you would have to do this with. Mm -hmm. And I think it also means taking a step beyond the case study. So looking out there and saying, okay, here's what organization X is doing, and it seems to be working for them. Then that might be a really good thing for you to do. Okay. However, uh, Having an evidence-based approach would mean taking another step and trying to figure out, okay, well, what are they doing and why might that work? And and if it is working, if it's getting the results that they supposedly claim, then um, what's different perhaps about our our context? How might we take the lessons from that and use it here, right? So it's not bad to read a book on what Google does or did with regard to HR, right? So, you know, they um, there's a good book that came out, uh, you know, on, on that whole topic, Um that I actually had my HR students read, right? And because it, it talks a lot about evidence-based ways to look at people. Uh, and I think that that's, that is healthy, right? But I think go beyond the case study is, uh, is my advice there. Bigger organizations, lots of time, have the resources to have an IO site person on staff. And, mm -hmm. and lots of times they'll have more mature processes in that area. Most yeah. of the time. That may not work for your mid-market manufacturing with a bunch of, you know, factory workers right. for selecting and hiring top tech talent that writes software for Google. So yet you still have to look at that context, even though that evident, they may have evidence-based practice there, but you would be surprised how big and how much money the organizations make that Ben and I talk to or look at that don't have it completely locked down. Right. Well, and, and the thing is, I, you know, They'll have Mal stinking thinking and well, big orders. Everybody has stinking thinking, right? I think there knowledge evolves. And and I think that that's kind of how this works with it when it comes to understanding how organizations work, how humans interact in these complex ways. And uh, you know, even if you do have it all sorted out as an organization, uh being you know somewhat skeptical of the own you know, your own um recipe is is, is a healthy practice. The last thing I'll mention here as an implication is for academics out there or aspiring academics, people who study these things, researchers, is I think, you know, consider how you interact with the real world, right? Because I, I, I am of the opinion, maybe an unpopular opinion, that working in academia or working in a think tank um, in a research-based role is not really the real world in a way, right? I mean, it's I really it. good at making you weird <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and learn how, you'll, you'll, you'll learn how to talk funny. I get it. It is a real job. It's a real, it is a real thing. Like, what and is, a needed what is job, real? an important sure, one. Absolutely. Yeah. But, it, but it is, I would say that it, it, there are some important differences between that and having to uh, make decisions about stuff and make things run. And, you know, sometimes you don't have a whole lot of time right? In, in actual organizations to do this stuff. And you have to satisfice a lot. You have to kind of sacrifice, you know, the optimal decision for something that's going to work. Like you just have to do things. Yeah. Sometimes. We know this update makes difference, but we have three more years in this uh, employee performance yeah. evaluation software contract. So we got to ride this yeah. suboptimal software pony until we can re up with another software vendor. Th that's really happens. Yes, and that, that, that and sounds, our managers uh, <laughs> already know how to use the tool and they yeah. know this, right? Like, so. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that all sounds very, very, that strikes very close to home right now for me, Chris, um, <laughs> given a very large organization I'm working with. Anyway, um, so I, I think academics should also consider how they communicate their findings. I think um, making things more accessible, like, you know, if, you, if you're a researcher out there and you have some really cool stuff you're doing, uh, come out and, um, you know. Let us know if you want to be on our podcast. Now, we get a lot of people who say they want to be our podcast, but uh, we turned on most of them. But yes, yeah, so we might, eat you, them alive in email before you, you have to see the you, embarrassment you, you might, on you air. Might be, you might be the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You might be the one. So, all right, last thoughts, Chris. All right, so this is super important if we want the world to be better. And I want to say to a lot of people, like, do you feel like your game is stagnant? Do you come in every morning and you're like, God, why am I doing this? You're probably stuck in a check the box kind of world. 
I come in, you know, I make the donuts, whatever that phrase is, right? You know, I, all right, here's the 1099s, W-2s. Okay, we're fire, fire, firing the following three people. All right, we're onboarding these two. And check in the box, check in the box, check in the box. I want to exhort you to up your game. Up your game beyond what your fellow HR or business professionals are doing. And you do that by reaching beyond the status quo, the stuff that you were told the monkey see, monkey do, and you reach out into an awesome emerging conversation of evidence-based practice and swim in that ocean for a bit. And, and you'll stick out in your orgs as, hey, this is a real forward thinker that's trying to change things. And on top of that, you'll have a countless impact on the people around you who will go to other organizations and have impacts and, and you know, just make the world a better place, guys. So today on the Indigo podcast, we have talked about this thing that's called the research practice gap and why it matters. We've talked about this uh, gap in terms of HR and some measurement of it, and we've topped it off with some implications for all of us. Thanks for listening to the Indigo podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.